the events of uh, August 7 and 8 will forever be etched in the minds of anyone who was residing or visiting the British Virgin Islands at that time as the impact, the unexpected impact of a tropical wave uprooted lives and uh, property. It's on to the recovery efforts, counting the costs, assisting the devastated and planning the way forward and learning lessons that are there to be learned. To help us today on The Big Story, to look at the recovery efforts for the territory, we have uh, joining us the head of the recovery task force, the permanent secretary in the Premier's office, Broderick Penn, the director of the Department of Disaster Management, Charlene Dabrio, and the deputy permanent secretary in the Ministry of Communications and Works, Jeremy Hodge. Welcome to The Big Story, everyone. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Now, uh, this is a very significant discussion that we're about to have because we know that the various departments and agencies have been hard at work, but you are now here to tell the territory, provide a report to the territory on what you've been doing and where the territory is headed. Now, before we get into the works of the task force and the various aspects, everyone right now is, well, some persons more so than others are now on tenterhooks as we're on an a hurricane alert at this point as we head on down to November 30, the end of the hurricane season. Irma is now a Category 3 hurricane, Ms. Dabrio. What's the latest in terms of Irma and advice to residents? Well, it's still about six days away, um, so we still have some time to really understand where it's tracking and where it's actually going to go. But all indications are that it's heading our way and we need to prepare for it. Um, it is at a Category 3 status and there is expectation that in the next 24 hours it will continue to strengthen possibly to a very, very strong Category 4 or Category 5. Um, the waters are just warm, uh, the environment is just perfect for this type of development. At the beginning of the hurricane season, we were told that the predictions for this year would be extremely high um, and we were cautioned that we would be entering a very active hurricane period and this obviously is is happening we've had Harvey that has had some impact on the southern Caribbean chain and then moved into Texas and now we're dealing with Irma and there is also another system behind Irma that's developing that we hope will track to the north so right now as it stands we are still very uncertain on the exact track but the, most of the models are saying it's either going to be very close or directly onto our location and so we have to be extremely ready for any impact. And when you say ready, just break down for us, remind us what exactly you mean because you know even though we've had you know quite an experience recently, it's human nature to get complacent after a while and especially when advisories are given and then nothing happens, you're like ah. So at this point, what is it that you want residents to be mindful of when it comes to staying on their P's and Q's for the rest of the season? That C word is such a bad word. <laughs> it's such, such, such a bad word for the entire Caribbean region. We are in a, a very high risk area. We are very susceptible to the hazards that come with hurricanes and storms. People have to start um, getting ready at the very beginning of the hurricane season. And that means personal readiness, You know, ensuring that you yourself that you have what you need if you're on medication, if you, uh, there are essential supplies that you need to have. Uh, with hurricanes, you do have power outages for a period of time, so businesses need to understand how do I operate if we do not have power, if we do not have communication. We do quite a bit of training with businesses and we also say to them, you have to think about your staff because you can be up and running and there's absolutely no one who can come in and function. So these are important things that businesses need to think about and from the Premier's office, we concentrate in working with them a lot on ensuring that that business resiliency is, is there. And we've seen some successes from that, particularly from the financial sector, I would say, uh, where the, there was the strength of the, of the preparations that's been done by the Financial Services Commission over the years have actually paid off. Um, but we still have a lot more to do. And, and I, as you said, people forget. And when things don't occur in your area, then you tend to say, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And then when you hear scientific language like 50-year return flood and 100-year <laughs> return flood, you know, you really have to try to interpret it in terms of the environment that we're in now. Um, the Honorable Pickering speaks a lot about climate change and about the impact it's having to the region. And this is a result of what is happening with climate. It's 
our, our weather patterns have changed, the impact to the environment is very different, and we're looking at flood events that inundate an entire city in 20 hours. That is historical. That is something that is very, very distinct to what has been predicted for climate change. And so Mr. Penn and Mr. Hodge, given that very situation that uh, Ms. Dabrio just spoke of, uh, knowing the state, we would want to see the weakened state of the territory's infrastructure. How do we prepare for what is likely to come in terms of our infrastructure, our buildings, and such like? OK, thank, thank you for that. I think um, the key to um, ensure that plans that you have in place, um, you're familiar with them, and you're ready to have them um, activated. And um, the disaster, disaster management, who actually is responsible for um, disaster preparedness, um, model in the region actually, in terms of their efforts, has long prepared um, this country um, to be able to deal with um, those um, unforeseen events. From uh, the government's uh, perspective, there's a number of things that um, the organization, such as Mr. Hodge's organization, uh, the Ministry of Communication and Work, does to help us get prepared with respect to the, um, the infrastructure. And I think I should probably let him speak there. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, as um, um, P.S. Penn mentioned, um, we do have a disaster preparedness um, plan for such events. and. Um, what we do is make sure that all our agencies are, um, are apt and have actually mobilized and gotten everything ready to ensure that our various um, areas to protect our infrastructure and of course our, our residents because all our residents depend on our infrastructures to, to be sound. And in the event of disruption that we are in a ready state and understand what everybody's role is to get things back to a state of, of normality as quick as, as possible. So, for example, public works are now mobilized in different areas to ensure that we have, in fact, cleared all our drains, um, ensure that all our major guts and areas are cleared up until the appointed, from now to the appointed time, um, to ensure that they are cleared and the water can flow where it needs to to cause minimal disruption to our infrastructure and residents and, and businesses. We are paying uh, close attention to small dreams that we take for granted and appeal to the public if you notice on the roadways next to your homes, um, small dreams that you may take for granted are a block that we have m missed. Feel free to call the ministry or disaster management, but you could call the ministry at 468-2183. Just let them know you're calling to report um, a fault and we'll be place to the appropriate person. We have water and sewage um, doing all that they need to do to ensure that all our reservoirs are filled um, up to the appointed time uh, that we expect a disaster, ensure that our, our pumps and our sewage lift stations are functioning to avoid um, disruptions. Um, the beaver electricity, you see them around, ensuring that brush is not touching the the um, power lines. So if you're in your area and you realize that you have branchy, branches that are growing too close or a tree that is too close to power lines, please call the electricity department uh, corporation at their emergency um, line and, and report it and they will be doing their best. All these things um, ensure that we have minimal disruption. If in the event of a disaster or you or emergency at your homes, remember that we have our force responders available, which are our fire and rescue department. Um, keep their numbers close and call them in in the case of, of, of you having a challenge at your, your homes. Uh, one other thing, uh, Ms. Dabry, I would point this one to you. Uh, very often we find in a state of emergency, persons are reluctant to leave their homes, leave their property, and make use of shelters. At what stage would you advise persons to just think about their lives, to think about uh, their health, and to make use of uh, shelters in the case of an emergency? I think in the BVI, I can safely say we probably have some of the best emergency shelters. They are shelters that have been specific specifically designed and maintained to house individuals for 48, up to 48 hours. Uh, we are supported by a, a, a 
broad mechanism from non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross, Police for Security, and we spent a lot of time making sure that these structures are safe for individuals. The, in, in the event that this uh, system were to affect us within 24 to 48 hours before impact, we will indicate to individuals that we are opening uh, certain shelters. We've had discussions with Anagata this morning about checking the shelter on that location to ensure that there is a structure available because as you can clearly understand the smaller islands are much more vulnerable than the mainland. So shelters are very important for individuals who are not safe in their homes and don't have an opportunity to go elsewhere uh, to, to have some safety there. Um, and really in the last few days we've been appealing to individuals who've been affected by the wave who have felt that their homes are not um, structurally sound or, or that they're in a, the path of significant flows from floods, that they are the ones that need to actually think about whether they need to move to these emergency shelters or whether they want to go to a family or a friend. Uh, we do encourage individuals to take that as a first option because obviously it is uncomfortable yes. in a shelter. It's not your home, they're not bedrooms, it's an open space, you're sleeping on cots. No privacy. Yes, no privacy. Um, and especially when you have children, it becomes a lot more complicated or older people. Uh, but we're really appealing to those individuals. If, you're n if you feel that you're not safe or you're not comfortable and you have no option, then you really need to think about going to the emergency shelters. Okay. All right, with that, we take a quick break right here on The Big Story. We're speaking recovery here in the aftermath of the recent tropical wave which affected the BVI's main island of Tortola. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Big Story. We are discussing a major issue here for the British Virgin Islands, the recovery efforts to get back the territory, particularly the main island of Tortola, to a state of a normalcy in the aftermath of the recent flash flooding. Now, Mr. Penn, you're the head of the task force that has the largest mandate in the territory at this point, a multi-sectoral task force. Tell us about the makeup of that task force and what it has been like getting things organized in the aftermath of the NEOC, the Emergency Operations Center. Okay. I think um, the, the, the task force, let me first say, um, as you pointed out, it's, 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 it's a multi-sectorial um, task force. I don't do it alone. Um, <laughs> frankly, I probably do the least of it. <laughs> this is the reason why I have Charlene and Jeremy um, here with me. And as you saw from the, from, 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 from the previous um, segment, the work that they do in advance make all work easier when it comes to um, recovery. So I think we are very strong in terms of um, disaster preparedness, Charlene and Jeremy talked about a number of the things that we have been doing. Um, the better we are at disaster preparedness, um, the easier the recovery um, task um, is. But what the recovery task force um, has been formed um, to do is to effectively coordinate the recovery efforts um, in a nutshell. Um, we are going to have varied impacts across varied sectors, across varied industries, um, when these events happen. And the task force is designed to lead and coordinate um, those efforts to ensure that recovery goes as smoothly as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, we want to try to um, reduce duplication of, 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 of efforts. We want to ensure that we have efficiency um, in the process. We want to make sure that there's accountability in the, in, in, in the process. We want to make sure that we're able to manage costs, um, et cetera. So we've created a, a, a structure um, which is led by me as a coordinating um, person, but a lot of the heavy lifting actually happens with the working groups. We have a structure where we have about nine or 10 different working groups. Um, a key among them is the infrastructure and utilities working group, which is headed by um, Jeremy and, and, and his team. We have um, DDM supporting the coordination efforts that the Premier's office is, is trying to do. But then we have a number of other working groups that are actually headed by my peers, the other PSAs, within their own functional areas. So for example, we have the aid management working group. Um, this is one of the working group that springs immediately into action post um, the, um, the event. 
um, to be able to provide um, immediate aid and to be able to assess um, the long-term aid needs. This is a working group that's headed by the, the Ministry of Health. Now, within that group, there's a lot of coordination of how do you get um, immediate relief, such as um, food, um, clothing, um, uh, shelter. Um, they also look at assessing claims um, for, for damages um, during, the, during the, um, the, the events. We also have um, working groups that are responsible for uh, vector control. I think that's one of the important things that we look at post um, the events. We have a working group that is responsible for uh, debris management. It's very important that we're able to manage all the debris that comes as a result of the, the events and manage them in a sustainable way, in a way that actually won't cause any additional difficulties for, um, the, for, for, for the recovery efforts. I think critical also is the government services working group. We know that the government is a machinery um, behind the running of the country, so we have to make sure that government is extremely functional. So we have a working group um, that we call government services that's headed by uh, the permanent secretary in the deputy governor's office who's responsible for the public service um, in, in, in any event. So along the lines of those functional responsibilities, we have um, a number of other working groups, communication to make sure that there's timely communication, to make sure that there's accurate communication and so forth. And we work cohesively to try to ensure that all our efforts are um, best coordinated so that we can work with the greatest of efficiency in order to be able to bring the territory back to a state of normalcy. We understand that you're still at a preliminary stage in terms of coordinating and calculating, but what have you been able to ascertain so far across sectors in terms of the areas hardest hit by the impact of this tropical wave? What we've um, identified is that the areas that were hardest hit um, are the Greater and Central Road Town um, area, um, ranging from uh, Port Purcell um, right down to, say, about the, the, the stoplights down by the administration um, dri drive. Those, that's, that was the, the greatest hit um, area. There was also um, significant damage in other areas, such as the East End area, um, a lot to the road infrastructure, a lot to the secondary roads, um, retaining walls, driveways, etc. Um, and Charlene can, um, I guess, provide a little bit more specific details on this. But where we see the hardest impact was effectively where there was the most rainfall. Mm -hmm. um, on the eastern end of the island, I think there was about 16 inches yeah. of, of, of rainfall um, and, and so forth. So. Charlie, can you help us with some of the technical yeah, well, details? <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you get 16, 17 inches of rain in 20 hours, there is no way that the drainage system is going to cope. Mm -hmm. So we just had a significant downpour in a very short period of time, and the watershed, as the permanent secretary described, the Rotang watershed was most significantly impacted. Uh, Rotang itself had just, just under 11 inches of rain. The eastern side in Virgin Gorda um, strangely had very, very intense rainfall. Uh, one, some of the things that we've seen coming out is that there's been a lot of washout as a result of drainage issues that need to be addressed very quickly. And there have been also been some landslides that have occurred, which is really has to do with the geology of the island. We live in islands with very, very narrow coastline, very steep hillsides, so the force of the water coming down is going to have an impact on the areas that are populated. In addition to that, we also had a full moon. So those of you who <laughs> believe in these things <laughs> um, understand that during a full moon, you have a high tide. So it, it really created a pressure issue, um, uh, not allowing water to, to run off as quickly as it should. So you did have ponding of a number of areas. Um, what we're also seeing is that individuals who are, were affected in 2003 and 2010 are individuals who are now being affected again. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we have to look at very seriously going forward. The infrastructure did get a good hit. Um, we had a lot of uh, work going on on roads. Um, there was the uh, CDB project that's in place yes. that's doing a lot of infrastructure work yeah. as well. So we were at that period where things were being fixed and then you had this significant downpour which obviously would have some effect on it because some of the projects were not complete. Um, it's very important for us as the recovery task force to look at the priority areas. And I'm going to go out here and saying that 
government cannot fix all the problems that we have faced. We, government just cannot. We do not have the financing. We do not have the, the capacity to do that. And so we have to prioritize areas that are focused on providing safety to individuals, to tourists and residents in the BVI. The economy obviously has been impacted and that is being calculated. The Central Statistics Office will soon provide the public with an indication of what the economic impact or the economic hit has been from this particular hazard. And in many instances, you, de you do see a drastic increase from the immediate recovery to the long-term, with, with the re long-term recovery costs. But I think Jeremy can clearly specify some of the, the more critical infrastructure elements that were hit hard. Um, mm -hmm. Um, we, we, it, apart from the torrential rainfalls and the water that, that um, came down, was it brought a lot of, of mud and debris, a significant amount of mud. If you even take a look at the back of the administration <laughs> complex where you have mountain. several <laughs> hundred cubic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the name. <laughs> where you have several uh, cubic yards of, of, of mud and stones which clogged up our guts, our drains, um, blocked up our roadways. We had huge landslides and because of these landslides, the waters that were supposed to go down the drains, of course, detoured around these landslides, undermined our roads, which we have um, clearly marked out now with even um, two by four um, structures so that you can see, just ask you to take caution in, in those areas. So um, it, it was also a tremendous, um, had tremendous impact on our water and our sewage infrastructure. Um, it also pointed out, I guess, some of the, the weak points, like you would have noticed some of the manholes yes. um, overflowing. And we found that a lot of our storm drains were leading to those manholes that we're now trying to correct to make sure they actually lead to the drains and head out to sea as, as designed because they end up blocking up our sewage manholes and those guys have to go in and, and clear them out. So um, we, we have gotten things back to um, more or less to normal. We have some small pockets and areas of where we still need to restore water. Uh, and um, for, the, for the most part, we've, we've managed the recovery okay. part. But Jeremy, okay. to uh -huh. a greater extent, while, um, while it was natural in many uh, cases and uh, the waters were doing what they had to do, there was a great responsibility that was trusted and is still trusted on the people of the territory, the way we dispose of things that we do not want and yes. the effects of that. Talk a little bit more on that aspect yes. of it. Uh, what we've also found is that guts can be very revealing. <laughs> Over the years, we may not have had so much rain to bring things up, but we found in guts, we found fridges, uh, we found stoves, we found car seats, mm -hmm. we have found coconut shells, and all those things cause a, a huge problem, especially in the, the greater Rotown area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the gut near the fire station that not comes sure out. I'm not sure I want to call it on TV either. <laughs> <laughs> But um, that was one of the areas that was hugely impacted because we had to pull out all those, those um, furnitures and, and fridges from, from out of there. We're asking persons to please dispose of those, those type of material in, in, the, in the right area, which would be at the... Um, um, the incinerator. The incinerator. Yeah. <laughs> at Parkwood Pond. At, at Parkwood Pond. Mm -hmm. Because it does, you'll be surprised that that fridge that you threw in there caused your home to... Yeah, well, not to only flood out, necessarily your home, but, but others, others as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so. How can we police this better? Um, we have to depend on our residents to, to assist us. There's no way for us to um, be able mm -hmm. to properly police, police or do it on a consistent basis. So we ask our public, if you see someone throwing a mattress in the gut, um, if you can um, report it to the, um, the authorities, would be with solid, solid waste, waste. Solid waste yeah. department, they would be fined as a result and also charge for removing that that mattress so we have to depend on you the public yeah. to assist us use in that area use these things more use the cell use phone these things more mm -hmm. we always doing selfies you don't have to give your yes. name <laughs> just just report it yes okay yes. i think it's important to stress though that there is um a proper solid waste management program mm -hmm. in place mm -hmm. um and the information about it is out there um 
not from where I sit, but even from in my personal capacity, I know, for example, that Solid Waste has um, routine times and trips that they use to yeah. take um, these um, these the, the, the heavy items um, down okay. to the incinerator. Okay. Uh, they're published. Um, they happen fairly uh, frequently and so forth. So it's really a matter, and this is my personal appeal, for persons to take a personal responsibility and simply do the right thing. Um, call the Solid Waste Department, take the bulky waste out to the areas designated um, for it on the days that are designated for it, and we'll be able to um, discard the waste and eliminate um, that, that, that um, little risk, what it seems to people that actually can turn into a big risk for um, the territory's infrastructure. And one of the things I want to point out as well, we found in, in constructing homes, um, we have a tendency when we dig the foundation to throw it on the side and leave it as a bed. The vegetation grows over it, you forget it's there, but the rain will bring it down. Reveal it, yeah. And we've had um, several feet in dirt on our main roadways um, as a result of, of such, such actions. And it would ask persons to haul the dirt away from the site and not leave it around the, the property. And I think I want to go yes. back to the point about the debris management, that mountain that you talked yes. about. It's yes. very, very important that those sites are established. Otherwise, people are going to clear and they're going to dump it back in the guts or in areas that are very vulnerable. So those debris management sites are very, very essential when you're looking at recovery operations. We control what happens there. We control how it comes in, how it's stored, mm -hmm. how it's protected. Um, that is a very, very important element of the recovery process. And we can also calculate the, the amount, the cubic feet of dirt that has actually been lost from the environment itself. So those elements are very, very critical. But I think going forward, it can't be business as usual, PS. Um, no, we have to make some changes, and yes. the enforcement mechanism has to be empowered to, to really go out and identify with these problem areas going forward. Yes. Sticking to those problem areas that have been identified and the way forward, what can you say in terms of reviewing building codes and where residential and even commercial buildings are developed so that you know those owners or those persons who end up in these properties don't end up in a similar position as they did earlier in August. What's the plan there? Well, um, the Tom Conyon, Tom Country Planning Authority actually falls under um, my ministry and we have um, work afoot um, from a policy perspective to try to address um, some of these concerns. Um, for example, um, we've started to develop new regulations that um, will set standards in relation to um, how foundations are cut in the, in the hillsides. Um, we've already had uh, a significant advancement in terms of um, where those are in the, in, in the process. And the importance of that particular um, um, issue is that it can help to mitigate against the potential for the undermining of roads. The point that Jeremy spoke about in terms of tossing the, the, the cut fill over um, the, 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 the side, it will help to mitigate against that um, also. Um, within that process, um, the chief planner and his team, they've um, determined what are the appropriate um, um, degree of cuts that should be had in the hillside to maintain um, slope stability, etc. So what we're doing now is we're trying to advance the regulations so that when they do become um, law, we're in a position to legally hold um, people accountable, um, penalties, etc. We're taking a, a proper and structured legal mandate to ensure that the right things are happening, especially when it comes to business development um, and, and, and home development. Now, there's a number of things that are already actually in place, and of course, what we're going to need is um, greater collaboration, um, greater enforcement to ensure that it, that it happens. But to be sure, a number of the things that happened in the central areas <coughs> with respect to um, the buildings and so forth, there was nothing significantly wrong or materially wrong in terms of the buildings that were constructed. Uh, I think it's important for, for people to understand that this was an unprecedented event. So for example, a, a building on the Castro Drive wasn't built too low. Um, or, or anything like that. They didn't breach anything. It's just that it was an unprecedented event. We, we have, I think, a greater difficulty um, in, the, um, in, in, in the hillsides with respect to setbacks, cuts, and, and, and the passing of um, the, 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 the fill. 
and we intend to address that with the regulations that are, that are, that are coming up. And education is very important mm -hmm. because what you're doing here at JTV and with this, this is part yes. of what we promote. Um, we have a transient population. People come from different parts of the Caribbean and different parts of the world. They don't understand what's a hurricane. They don't understand a lot of the things in our environment. So um, it's very different. Yes, in Guyana, there are no hurricanes. You do get floods, though. Um, so it's very important that we, we you know, marry that with the education and starting with the education from school all the way through. Um, in next week, we're actually having, hopefully, having a workshop for heavy equipment operators okay. because we felt that coming out of this event and previous events that this is something that we need to address. Um, very young guys on operating these very um, impressive pieces of equipment and we need to ensure mm -hmm. that they are cutting the right way that they're maintaining their equipment, they're cleaning the guts adequately, and so we want to continue this type of education going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a very quick break and sure. come right back to this discussion looking at the recovery efforts in the aftermath of the recent tropical waves. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Big Story, looking at what's being done to get the British Virgin Islands back to normalcy in the aftermath of the devastation wreaked by the recent tropical wave. Now, uh, Mr. Hodge, let's get back to infrastructural affairs because that's one of the areas that residents are very concerned about, especially yes. from uh, the local perspective as well as the big business perspective because tourism is huge for the territory. So works are underway. Tell me the areas that have so far been repaved or um, addressed and what's left, but also address for me. Some persons are concerned that the ministry may be moving too quickly in trying to repave the damaged roadways amid you know, what is already a turbulent hurricane season. So explain the rationale behind that as well. Okay, thank you. Speaking about the <coughs> recovery efforts on the infrastructure, I'll begin with um, um, damage to our electrical infrastructure as well. Um, we've had, after the weather, lots of um, down poles due to um, landslides, um, compromised roadways that those poles were depending on. And it took um, a lot of effort for us to work cohesively as a public works department, as a ministry, as a corporation to get it done. Um, I also take the opportunity to thank all the private contractors, operators, um, and residents. Residents came out with their shovels and brooms and came to assist. We, we could not have gotten that all clear without um, all that teamwork and team and community effort. So I just want to, don't want to forget to, to mention mm -hmm. those persons. Um, BVEC, as usual, have a, a very uh, proficient um, system in place. They were able to get it, the, the power back on um, to at least 75% within a 24-hour within period about. Um, some other areas, um, probably like Kooten Bay, Little Dicks, um, the hill areas, there was more damage. There were a lot of poles down in those areas. And, um, while we're sorry it took so long in those areas to get power back, it was a tremendous effort um, to get it back. We're now at 98, uh, about 100% recovery now, back to where we were. And again, um, persons who notice branches, trees too close to power lines, please report it to the BVIEC. Um, with regards to our water and sewage infrastructure, with all the, we've had a number of damaged um, lines. Most of our main lines were, did stand up. Um, some were exposed, and while they are operable, um, being exposed is not the, the most, um, it's not ideal. the best mm -hmm. or ideal circumstances for them to be on because water moves and there's a lot of pressure. So of we had to improvise to try to steady those exposed pipes until we get the road infrastructure that they depend on um, fully um, restored. Um, our sewage system, we also did have um, um, some challenges with um, some systems that were damaged for a brief period of time. We have now our modern sewage treatment plant at the Port Point area that um, manages all the sewage in the greater Rotown area from Bogus Bay um, to Prospect Reef. And um, we were also able to get that back, that department was able to get it back and running 
within a, a 24 hour period. Um, in terms of the roadways, so far we have, I understand the concern of the public in terms of restoring too quickly amidst that we're still in the hurricane season, but we still have to make every effort to make our roadways safe for persons to, to traverse. Um, you'll notice in some footage that we have, have um, gathered that persons are avoiding um, potholes and yes. other um, disruptions in the road. And we can't continue to allow that to happen because while it may cost, um, one life is too much or, and we can't um, take that chance. So we did begin with the, the most um, popular roadways <coughs> such as um, the Joe's Hill area, which took um, quite a beating, um, the Fort Hill area, and now we're in the Eastern area. And what we're doing, most hills are concrete based and you know that um, asphalt and concrete don't bond that well naturally. <laughs> so we have to use what the engineers call a tech oil. Make sure we, we have to have dry conditions, dry it, and also resurface them. Um, we will also be um, doing works in the Huntum's Gut area. Huntum's Gut took quite a... Oh, boy, we uh, saw what's going on yes. on the hillside there. Yes. Yeah. So on the Great Mountain area, you'll notice that we did have some undermining. And those areas we are now trying to put in place at least some kind of temporary measure to make it as safe as we can until um, the assessment is done. We did have some hydrologists coming in that um, the government of the Virgin Islands through the disaster management has a close rela rela um, working relationship with at the um, University of Puerto Rico. They came in along with our engineers and visit about uh, 35 sites that we need in. Um, attention to. Uh, we expect um, for this report to be um, shared to us in, in more English terms <laughs> um, <laughs> next week as to what we're looking at and what we will place priority towards rebuilding because we're still in the recovery mode. Um, we also have to do some resurfacing at the Brewers Bay. I uh, was just going to ask you about area. what's going on there. So what we've done was we had to remove all that asphalt on the it's entering from the Mount Healthy side. Yes. Uh, we have to, we have removed it all. We will not be resurfacing that road or um, until after at least this tropical wave passes. We need very dry conditions and we need it to be able to set a bit because uh, we don't want it to um, be disrupted again. So um, that's what we are doing now. If you head to the eastern area, you'll notice that they're doing some work there. Those roads are pretty bad the water managed to get under the, the asphalt mm -hmm. so you have these bubbles and it's, it's very unsafe um, for driving so yeah. we're in that area right now we've had the experience we drove <laughs> through Bruce Bay and we were like literally yeah. screaming yes. and going, don't slide with us yes. uh, I, I, think, I think your experience actually um, underscores very clearly the rationale for yeah. what the Ministry of Communications yes. has been doing while I have seen um, some of the um, comments and understand where they're coming from, um, I think they're totally unfair in that Jeremy just explained that they're not doing this um, willy-nilly. Yes. Um, they have a song rationale uh, behind of it. They understand the technical um, issues uh, behind of it, and they're actually doing it in conform they're, they're, they're repatching the roads in conformity um, with that. As he also pointed out, there is going to be a, a long-term rehabilitation process that's going yes. to be put in place. Coming out of that re long-term rehabilitation process, you will probably see a number of um, road projects to actually get us to the standards of roads that we need. But in terms of the immediate yes. safety um, of the public, in terms of the immediate mobility um, of the motorability of the, of the roads, it was absolutely important that we go and do some resurfacing in those, um, in those critical areas. So I, I want to make that very clear um, for, the, for the public. It's not an ill thought idea. Mm -hmm. It's um, a deliberate decision that the government has taken to make sure that the roads are safe and, 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 and motorable. And you are going to see um, in the coming months and years, longer term fix um, aching to the ones where they've had some very great success with the CDB projects where we have really well, to, um, well built roads. And this is just an interim um, solution. Okay, and that's why we're so happy to 
finally have you guys here yes. to communicate this yes. with the public because it's in the absence of, of communication that perceptions are, 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 are born. Misperceptions. perceptions are, are born. Yeah. Right? And so doing this here is, is such a great thing to applaud. But I would love if you can more talk now to the public in cooperating with the public works and all the departments while they conduct these repair works. I've witnessed it more than often where the barriers are up and the workmen on the road are appealing to the, the, the motorists hold and persons are literally forcing them way through and I think uh, yes. at one instance on uh, Fort Hill uh, heavy duty equipment came into collision yes. with a vehicle. So how do you appeal to commuter, commuters to help in this uh, process. I think we are all part of the recovery process and I think that's the message we need to get out to everybody. Doesn't matter if you're five or six or seven or 90, we are all part of this process and we have to understand that the obstructions that they will get there will translate into a longer period of time for recovery. We have been trying to get the message out. We have been reaching out to individuals. In some instances, we've had to close roads and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that people are cooperating because the cooperation now can transfer into many positive things. Yes. But I do want to say we were hit hard, but there are lots of good examples of what worked well as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Greenland field in East End, there was a yes. comparison between two of the fields um, playing fields in Tortola and you saw the, the power of the engineering and I want to get back to the fact that we have this memorandum of understanding with the U University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez from 1990. They have worked with us to do many things, to look at tsunami warnings, tsunami equipment. Um, they've worked with us to, to develop the geology maps, our landslide maps and so forth. It's very important that we're able to transfer that information to our techn technicians on the ground. So having a teaching institution partner with us at this particular stage of recovery is very important because we don't want individuals to just come in and tell us. We want them to also show the technicians and show the engineers how it can be done better and the example of the bonding of the, the surfacing was something that came out as a teaching point in the 2010 event uh, when we engaged the University of the West Indies and Dr. Cooper and the others came on board and really sat with the engineers to, uh, to get them to understand that that application has to be done well and now you're seeing the successes of that. So I, I, I want to put that point in that it's very, we, are, we are recovering but we are being very thoughtful in the steps that we are taking towards recovery. Okay. All right. Let's. I'll come back to you, Ms. <laughs> Deborah, because I want us to delve into this issue of vector control, which is a massive concern right now. But I have to go back to roads because, again, we have you here, and so it's best to have you provide the answers that persons are asking. Another concern that some persons have raised about the road network, especially in light of this event, but has been a long-standing one, is. The, in terms of your long-term road network plan, there's the issue of the new asphalt roads and then the old concrete roads, yeah. which some persons say worked just fine and then now you go and throw some asphalt on it and look what happened. So why is it that the government is going in this direction of asphalt as against concrete? Explain the, the, the rationale there. What I will explain with that, um on, on hills, um, con the rationale for putting concrete on the hills is because you will always have um, a gross amount of water moving down hills. And with undermining, con concrete holds better and gives us time to mitigate any undermining. Um, also, we, yes, you'll say concrete is strong and we should not apply asphalt, but for safety, the rubber tires hold stronger to, uh, to asphalt. asphalt concrete tends to get wet and slippery and very dangerous. Where you may find, per, find us putting, placing asphalt on concrete in residential areas, so to speak, is a noise pollution. Concrete, you can hear the tires ripping against it um, very loudly and you're in your home. So we do put, um, again, the asphalt for, to quiet the noise pollution and also for safety, your brakes and your tires against asphalt will hold stronger. Um, against concrete, if it's moist or too smooth in a particular area, um, that couple inches that would have avoided impact 
um, could, could cause um, loss of, of life or unnecessary in, um, injury. So, um, I'm no engineer, and so <laughs> are a lot of persons out there yes. who have a lot to say. So, is it based on what we can see in some of the on some of the road networks where the asphalt has been ripped apart from the underlying concrete, is there a mechanism, for want of a better term, that can be used or that's being looked at going forward to have a better grip yes. between those two d separate kinds of materials going yes. forward? What we've learned that we've been doing wrong over the years, Joe Hill has stood up for a, a tremendous amount of time through all types of weather, but what we had been doing over the years was when there are potholes or other faults with the road, we'd be placing more asphalt on top of um, faulty asphalt. So you have a number of layers of asphalt on top of each other, and once water gets under one of those layers, water will then, um, what you said, um, Joe's Hill, remove the asphalt quite quickly. So uh, what we've learned, as uh, Ms. Debrio has just expressed, is that once we can get the area, remove the faulty asphalt, because asphalt tends to take the form of whatever is under the surface. If it's a bumpy surface, it will seem smooth today. But if there were potholes and other blemishes, it will take that shape over a period of time. If the asphalt beneath it is already loose, of course, that asphalt on top is holding on to that loose foundation. So now we have what we call a, a milling machine, where we can run that milling machine. If we have the time, um, it recycles that asphalt into road-based material for other projects. We would remove all that asphalt on the surface, um, um, place what we call uh, a tech oil on it first, which is very sticky. It holds to the concrete, and it will also hold to the asphalt that we place on top of it. So that, that would hold for a, a longer time and, 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 and um, stronger integrity of our roads. Uh, like Peter Gay said, uh, we are no engineers, <laughs> we are no <laughs> expert. But I've noticed that going up Fort Hill and turning into Butu Mountain, where I traverse very often, just the Thursday before that, uh, that, that storm came, there was some concrete that was put there to block, uh, to repair a little damage that was there, was ripping away a uh, person's axles and stuff. And what I've noticed, when that storm came and ripped up that entire road, that particular concrete patch stayed put that we can turn into Butu Mountain yes. without any problem. So it shows us some technicalities there yes. as it compares to the asphalt and the concrete. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> All right. And on that note, it's a science. You don't want to be involved in good and what's being worked on. Yeah. Yeah. We take a very short break and come right back to wrap up the big story. Speaking about the way forward to get the BVI back to where it needs to be in the aftermath of the recent flash flooding. Welcome back to The Big Story, looking at the way forward for the British Virgin Islands and the plans being put in, in place, what, what worked, the lessons that have been learned, and we have members of the Recovery Task Force here with us. Mr. Penn, let's talk about insurance. Some people have it, some people don't, some people don't see the point of it, but you recently met with some eight insurance companies to, to discuss a number of areas as a part of this recovery process and what can be done going forward. What were some of the main points that came out of uh, those discussions in light of this tropical wave? Yes, Peter. We, we had a very good meeting um, with um, the Insurance um, Agents Association. Um, it, we had, uh, I would describe, very productive uh, discussions uh, between themselves and um, the Recovery Task Force and members of, of, of DDM. And I think a couple of key things um, came to light. Um, one is that a number of people actually don't have insurance. Um, and a number or a lot? <laughs> <laughs> a number of people don't have insurance, <laughs> and um, we, in our in our in our assessment, is actually one of the questions that that, that, that we ask yeah. of um, businesses and of individuals. 
and we are noticing that a fair amount has um, insurance, but others don't have insurance. Um, people sometimes just opt not to have insurance because um, the way they risk and the benefits um, of it. Um, I think it's important that people have um, some level of insurance. Um, what we, what, one of the interesting things that came out of the meeting though is that um, often persons aren't uh, informed of um, the type of insurance that they have and the coverage that they have. So one of the things that we agreed is that insurance companies um, would work to better educate um, their clients in terms of um, which coverages are more important um, and what levels of coverage, coverage they need um, to, 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 to have. Um, and I think that's probably one of the key things that can happen going forward. The other thing that came out of it is that we, we, we noticed that the um, small business sector in particular um, didn't really have uh, insurance. The larger businesses would, but the small businesses wouldn't. And uh, we hope that in the future we can work towards a, a micro-insurance scheme where we can get more small businesses involved in um, uh, being insured. In, with respect to some of the, some of the coverages, I, I think there's, there's some learning that has to be done there, uh, particularly by homeowners, in terms of whether, for example, the, the walls are insured, the retainer walls are insured, mm -hmm. um, versus whether or not only the house is insured. Wow. Um, if the retainer walls is part of the structure, then it'll, it'll be insured. If it's, if it's a separate thing, it, 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 it isn't unless you go out and, um, and buy um, insurance um, for it. One of the things we were pleased with, though, is how engaging they were in terms of um, reaching out, um, assessing um, uh, persons' claims, um, etc. Um, they're not shying away from their responsibilities. Um, they know that um, people that, that are insured, they, they, they have to take care of them. And I think one of the messages they gave us is that they're trying to do it as um, expeditiously as, as possible. They were very happy to um, engage uh, with, the, with the government because we see each other as um, key partners in ensuring that um, persons within the community, businesses within the community, has appropriate coverage um, for, 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 to be able to um, take care of their properties in um, the eventualities that something like this happens. Okay, and Charlene, mm. in, the, in the absence of dealing with the persons who do not have insurance for their properties, their homes, their businesses, I know uh, for a fact there was this call out for persons to come into the DM and uh, state what their losses were because there was some sort of an assistance that mm -hmm. could have been had. Talk a little bit about how that works and, you know, I know for sure it's a pressure on the government's pocket. Yeah, and, and going back to the positive things that I've happened during this event it's for the first time we've actually seen a non-governmental organization partnership approach so you have the Red Cross Rotary FSN Lions Club coming together and really working with us to address the immediate needs of the community so they focus specifically on providing food and clothing to individuals who needed to have that and to support us in the assessment and then we had Rotang Wholesale coming on board and providing uh, food vouchers for individuals who w would have needed that in that immediate phase we transitioned that into identifying who are those individuals out there that the government will need to really give some level of financial contribution to get them back up and running. And these are the individuals who do not have insurance. Um, the numbers have been very similar to 2010. Um, so we now need to look at to see whether the microinsurance mechanism can help to support those individuals who have been affected and try to help them to reduce their risk. But coming out of this event, um, the whole issue of compensation and versus your, uh, your willingness to continue to accept the risk over and over really has to be looked at. Yes. Um, we want people to come out of that environment. Uh, we want people to do things to better themselves and not be, be vulnerable every time you have an event. So we have collected a number of claims. They will be going to a committee, um, I believe, next week, and the committee will assess and determine what support will be given to these individuals. But it really is minimal support to get you back up and running with basic items. 
uh, no, we're not going to be covering your stereo sets and your collection of uh, videos from 1967. We're really focusing on giving people an opportunity to have a bed to sleep on, something to cook on, and something to store their food in. You remember the, the stats from uh, 2010? It was just about 312, so oh. we are at that similar number now. Wow. But as I said, we are seeing individuals who have been affected continuously. Mm -hmm. Those are the individuals we want to target. Those are the people that we want to, to help um, to get out of that particular risk. We can't continue to put financing in every time you, you are affected. Um, it's not a welfare system. It is just really to give some immediate support to get yourself back up and running. And through the process, we have been very, very careful in identifying elderly people and individuals who may have physical disabilities, young children, um, just to make sure that those families and those units are, are quickly being addressed um, to give some level of support. But we had a fantastic outpouring of support from volunteers, the Rotary Club, Lions, the Red Cross. I mean, this was really the first time that we had seen that level of partnership towards one particular event. Okay. And uh, we do have a project that was recently um, financed and under grant through CDB, which is looking at a partnership approach with non-governmental organizations to help specific communities. So this is something that we are going to continue. As I said, there's been a lot of good things coming out of the response um, from the BVI community. Yeah, that's nice. Sometimes disasters bring out the best of us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So as we've seen in terms of the community-mindedness, community, community mindedness, NGOs and the private sector banding together with the government to respond. Ms. Dabria, let's talk about diseases mm -hmm. because we we all should be alert to the fact that quite a few of us, if not all of us, are now at risk for vector-borne illnesses, waterborne illnesses such as cholera in light of sewage having mingled at some point with either water or infrastructure in some way, shape or form. I understand that the truck that does the fogging has been increased to two, so at least there's some effort there to keep the mosquito population down. But what can you say about efforts to sensitize and contain any developments in I that think regard? This, this has been something that the PS has taken on you know, himself, so I will let him speak to that point. But, but I, want to talk the, I want to talk about the point with diseases. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had individuals who have said the buildings the have been flooded. There is no contamination coming from that. It's, mm -hmm. those, it's are, those are contained. It's <laughs> uh, more of a, a psychological thing. Um, in terms of water quality, we went out very, very early in the first few days, first few hours, and started looking at uh, water quality testing, and those results were coming in and showing us that the level of contamination was not significant. But we took the appropriate steps. We were very careful um, with the individuals who were going out. We wanted to ensure that we were not putting people at greater risk by working in possibly contaminated areas. But this was not the case. Um, we did water quality testing at the beaches. We did water quality testing at many other locations. Um, we, the water runs off very quickly. Obviously, there will be silt deposits in the bays that we have to look at at some point in time. But the whole issue of vector is something that you see coming out from these rainy events. So I'll, I'll let the PS, because he's been very passionate in making sure that this element of it is addressed. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to where um, Charlene um, started, though. In, in the BVA, we tend to be very alarmist um, over, over a number of things because we have um, have some knowledge and so we're glad for the opportunity to be able to come in in some cases debunk the issues like the point that you made just now about um, about about cholera um, I think it's very important um, for people to understand that the government has the best interest at heart and that we're going to do everything within our control for them to remain um, safe and for our country to continue to be viable um, as, as, as it is and um, just um, jumping back a little bit um, to what Charlene talked about in terms of the water quality testing also. We didn't get a chance to mention some of the other working groups that we have. We have an environmental working group, for example, that's doing an assessment of the beaches, that's doing an assessment of the water quality um, at the beaches, that's assessing the agriculture um, sector and how it's been impacted, etc. So on many different fronts, um, we have these working groups. In the schools, we have, uh, we have a similar working group that's responsible for, for the schools. I think um, 
it's another example of where we had significant partnership from um, the NGOs, um, private individuals, parents, students, etc., to help the school get back to a state of res readiness, and it really showed the resiliency of the uh, of the people. So that's just another one of the working groups that I think has been ve uh, functioning very well. Now, vector control. Um, we have a working group that's um, specifically responsible um, for health, including vector um, control and, 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 and vector management. Um, yes, the mosquitoes are pesky, um, mm -hmm. and we've seen some um, growth in them. Uh, that's to be expected when you have um, so much rains. But I think from day one, um, the ministry activated um, its vector control plans and started to do what it needed to do, including um, oiling um, of, of, of standing water and going out and doing the, 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 the fogging. Um, we have, I have given a mandate um, for there to be um, um, an enhanced and accelerated vector implementation. And so we are looking forward to see even um, more activity from the, from, the, from the vector control team. And we're committed to give them the resources that they, that they, that they need to, 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 to do it. I think it's important for the public to understand though, is that something like vector control uh, with all its complexities have to be done within a, a structure. So, for example, um, fogging when it's um, rainy is totally, um, totally, totally, totally uh, useless <laughs> and inadequate. So um, they have to um, plan what they're doing um, based on what's happening in the environment. They have to prioritize the areas with, with which they're targeted. They have to partner with other organizations. So, for example, we've heard the airport come up as a hotspot um, for mosquitoes. Well, the BVA Airport Authority has its own vector control plans in place, mm -hmm. which they've been doing. Um, they've also been doing it in coordination with the Ministry of Health um, vector control team. They've been um, assessing the ponds in the area. Um, they've been um, oiling all of the, um, the, 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 the places that catch the water. For example, the drain. They've done significant assessment of the drains in and around um, the airport. Um, they've, they've, they've oiled them. They're working in conjunction with the ministries team and went to fog and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think we even seen great partnership there. So I think the message that I want to send is that yes, we are aware that, um, that there are mosquitoes um, out there and that um, they bred, bred up um, significantly. It's to be expected, but we have an active vector control um, process in place and we've given a mandate for it to be accelerated so that we can get the best <coughs> result out of there. Here's another issue that some persons get it, others don't. And it's about why wasn't there a declaration of a national emergency, a state of emergency in the aftermath of the tropical wave one? And why didn't the government let the RFA come and help? They wanted to help, so let them help. It's a big ship with all kinds of resources. The Premier explained in one of his updates why that decision was made. So for those persons who still can't comprehend why is it that you would res refuse help? Explain to them the rationale behind that, those two decisions. Okay, I'm gonna um, speak a little bit about it first, but then I'm gonna hand over to Charlene to speak specifically about what transpired, um, as well as to explain the process for declaring um, a, state a, state of, a, state of, a state of emergency. And I think it's, people should be very clear that we didn't do it, that we didn't do it for deliberate reasons because we didn't think it uh, um, rules um, to, to, to that level. It's a process that's done in consultation with um, people above all pay grade. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but, but in terms of the, um, of, of, of the, of the RAF um, ship, I think the, uh, the Premier uh, did explain it in his statement. I think people um, in some cases are willfully not um, listening. And it is as simple as this. Um, the ship won was a certain distance away from us. And Charlie will explain some of those details. I'm not going to um, get into that. There was a determination that by time that ship got to provide um, assistance to us, our recovery efforts would have been well in hand. And in fact, there were. Uh, we had the event on the, the Monday, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Monday morning. Yes. I was just speaking to um, a, a, a contractor um, in, in, in the business community. He told me he was out on his backhoe the Monday afternoon, after the initial set of hard rains, clearing Huntham's gut. So I just want to point out the resiliency of our people to say 
that from time the event happened, we had started the recovery. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. We had yes. started and the that recovery was process. And cases. on Tuesday, um, those efforts were even um, significantly accelerated. Uh, the response of Jeremy and his team in terms of starting to do the key things, clearing the, um, the roads, um, all the major blockages, um, etc. Those things were very, um, were very well in hand. Um, I've had this discussion with, 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 with friends of mine and so forth, and I said, you know how much heavy equipment um, there is on this island? And I said, and they said, no. I said, I can tell you, it's multiple more than what is on the area of ship. <laughs> having, sa having said that, though, the point is, is that when um, uh, the officials assessed where we were in the recovery um, process, a determination was made that the recovery was already well advanced. in uh, advance, um, well in hand. And I think it's important for people to understand exactly what um, the ship um, does. The ship is an, is an emergency um, response ship. They don't come, they don't stay in your country for a week or two weeks, three weeks, a month, helping you um, shovel and, 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 and do whatever else. And it, uh, you can see with, uh, with, with our disaster, a lot of what needed to be taken care of was the, 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 the clearing of mud, the clearing of roadways, um, et cetera. By the Tuesday afternoon, most of the major roadways were already cl um, cleared um, by Jeremy and his team. The ship wouldn't help us um, do that. The washing down of pack and lots of sweeping of road, the clearing and drains of, of, and those type of things, that's not what um, the, the, the ship does. And Charlene can explain that a little bit more. But the point, of the, the point is, is that the critical things that need to be done, the government already had them in hand. Electricity was back up from, from Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That's something that it could have um, yeah. assisted us with. Water generation, we had no issues with water generation. That's something that they could have helped us um, with. So I think a deliberate decision was taking that the recovery efforts were well in hand. We were advanced with some of the major things that needed to, to be done. And so it wasn't necessary to have the ship come and try to help us um, clean up around town. State of emergency. I'm not sure I know I need to add more to that. <laughs> <laughs> the explanation is perfect. Um, you know, the ship is a critical resource for the entire Caribbean region. And if we are to prematurely ask the ship to come here, and by the time they get here, we're already cleaning up, it's really a waste of resources. Um, we were consulting with the governor's office, and we were informed on the Tuesday at midday that the ship was available, but it was off Anguilla. It would have taken some time. And when we calculated the time of getting the ship here, we were already moving. The ship, we didn't need a ship to come in to make water. Water was back up and running. Power was being restored. Um, and I think we need to do, and I've spoken to the governor's office about this, we need to do a better awareness of what the real role of the ship is when it does come in because it's really to get immediate action in a very short period of time because the ship has to move on to other areas. Um, yes, there are skills on the ship that we will use if there were, there were a major event, but remember that the impact was mainly to very specific locations on Tortola. It was not a territory-wide mm -hmm. um, impact, and we had an emergency situation coming from a wave. This was not a storm. Mm -hmm. It was not a hurricane. It had no name. It was a wave, and we get four or five waves coming through every week. Unfortunately, it interacted with an environmental factor that created the level of precipitation that we had. In the United States, um, the federal government, the laws um, written by the federal government call for state of emergency, declaration of disaster, and all these terms. This is not the legal mechanism in the Caribbean. Um, you can declare areas that can be disaster areas, and we did that in 2010, but only to allow for the release of water. And this was done to support the infrastructure work where we had certain areas that we could not access. And the legal mechanism that was there to allow that kicked in. So we, we had an order that was issued for four specific areas to allow for the, the, the release of water um, from those areas to prevent any further problems. But you would not see many countries in the Caribbean moving into this unless it is a requirement for international aid. Um, as I said, we can declare particular areas, but we were up and running. We, we did not have a disaster. We had an emergency situation that was being handled by a deployment of a number of resources from government that had the ability to address the problems that we had. Um, and I wanted to make that very clear. But while you're on it, I also want to bring up another point here. Um, you know, this whole issue of information, because the, the public, was, some members of the public was very critical that the government did not give the warning early. 
you go back to the DDM Facebook or website and you look at when that initial notification was posted. From the 1st of June, we have been providing daily weather updates. These are provided on the radio, they're provided via television, they're provided by St. Thomas. We have access to that level of information. At 8.11 on Monday morning, we issued a weather advisory with cautions that there will be rain, that there will be the potential for, um, that there will be the potential for thunderstorm activity and that individuals need to start exercising some level of awareness um, to what was happening. Um, later on in the morning, we made contact with the Festival and Fairs Committee, and when the rain started, there was a decision to close. A very difficult position, because that had never happened in the history of the BVI, but for safety purposes, mm -hmm. the decision was made to close the festival. Mm -hmm. in, a lot of individuals chose not to adhere to that um, warning and not to adhere to that instruction. We don't have a mechanism like the United States where we have Curfew. mandatory evacuation mm -hmm. or curfews, our laws mm -hmm. are not written because we are good people. We, we <laughs> normally follow, <laughs> follow rules. Um, so it, it, you know, it's very important that people spend time on a daily basis to understand what is happening in their environment. We are in the hurricane season. We said to you at the beginning of June, be ready. The, the predictions are saying that it's going to be a very active season and people have to remain in that level of, with that level of awareness and they must be ready at all times. We're just in, in August. It's usually September to remember and then we have floods in November. So there, there may be a lot more to come and we have to continuously maintain that level of readiness and that level of preparedness throughout the entire hurricane season. So I am begging, I am pleading, I'm, I'm, whatever we can do, we have been doing to get information out. It goes out through every single mechanism. Some systems are quicker than others. Social media is very effective now, so we try to push it there as a first delivery point. But it's the onus is on you as an individual to make sure that you are getting the message and that you are able to act on it. Uh, Charlene, I see you on, on, on uh, social media at 11 o'clock. One night they had to text her. Say, girl, you don't you sleep. Did. <laughs> you did. But that also shows a level of commitment. And it would be remiss of me not to point out one thing. I was at Rotary yesterday, and I learned from the BVI EC. And, you know, yes, we had so many uh, different departments and so out there doing what they had to do. But it struck me, and it's still with me when the Mr. Leroy Abraham said that they were actually caught with their pants down uh, because of the fact that they had not more than 12 persons on duty on island and it was that small contingent of persons who took care of this entire territory to make sure that the electricity was restored I mean that in itself is Amazing, and they say there was one woman among the team too. <laughs> that was yeah, yeah, she's very so powerful yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from his ministry. Oh, okay, uh. Yeah, I mean, it shows of the resilience, the resilience, resilience. Yeah, resilience yes. of the people that we have here, and the ability, and it also gives credence to the reason why it, there was no necessity to have the external uh, assistance coming because. We are indeed capable. And remember, we are sending those crews to other islands to assist. We sent them yes. to Bahamas, we sent them to TCI, they've been to Grenada. So we do have the capacity mm -hmm. to be able to recover. The government has invested millions of dollars. The disaster management program started in 1979, and there's been consistent provision of funding towards that. So there is that level of capability and ability to, to get to this stage very quickly. But I do want to say too, and I do want to remind a number of individuals, we have brilliant, brilliant people yes. in the BVI. Mm -hmm. And if we can come together and work together, there's nothing that we cannot achieve. Mm -hmm. And that's the message that we want to get out of here. The final result has to be that we did this together. Yes, yes. One BVI, Standing one strong. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, couldn't have had a more perfect <laughs> note on which 
Correct. Yes. And what we can describe as basically a comprehensive report from the team and its coordinator in chief leading the recovery efforts of the British Virgin Islands in the aftermath of the recent tropical wave. And the key message to everyone is to be on alert, be vigilant for the remainder of the hurricane season. On behalf of Kathy Richards, that's it from this week's Big Story.